Minnesota's diversity of prairies, forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife make it an outstanding state for a broad array of outdoor activities that appeal to all kinds of interests and skill levels. Joining me to provide our annual update on the health and well-being of the great outdoors is Sarah Stroman, the Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. Deer hunting season is almost upon us. We talk about this every year and firearm season begins on November 5th. I haven't heard as much lately about chronic wasting disease as I have in years past. So in general, how is the deer population and will this be a good hunting season? Well, let me first say I'm, I'm disappointed that you haven't heard as much about chronic wasting disease as years past, we'll, but we'll get to that. I think um, I'm very excited for the firearms deer opener. I think it will be a good season. Um, there'll be lots of opportunity uh, in many parts of the state. And so certainly wish uh, our half a million deer hunters in Minnesota uh, a good season and a safe season. Uh, for the CWD specifically, um, you know, I think it's important to remember it's still relatively rare in Minnesota. Um, in the places where we see it, it's still in less than 1% of the deer that we sample. But knowing that it can spread, um, from deer nose to nose contact and knowing that um, humans can move them when we're moving captive deer, um, it's still really concerning to us here in Minnesota because deer hunting is such an important tradition. It's such a huge part of our economy. And so we really do wanna get ahead of it. We wanna to continue to be aggressive. And actually this year, we're gonna have some new opportunities uh, for hunters to get their deer sampled, either working with taxidermists. And um, this year, we're also, in addition to our sampling stations we have around the state, offering mail-in kits um, for hunters to do themselves. So folks should check out their web our website if they're interested in that. Lots of good information there. Okay. Uh, on a related note, Minnesota Public Radio did a story recently about a DNR program that asks hunters to share their observations when they're in their blinds, when they're in the wild, about what they see, other wildlife, how the deer, everything. So. They said that, uh, the, the report said that Minnesota's program is not as successful as some in nearby states, but what is your pitch to hunters and why is it important that they help the DNR document the state of our wildlife? Yeah, well, I think what we're seeing is just a little bit of a slow start to, to a new program. Um, we, of course, have a long history of citizen science here in Minnesota, whether it's people who monitor lakes for water quality or people who count loons um, nesting in the summer. And so this is just something new. I think we're going to be on track um, with where we want to be more this year. But the idea is that we have these half a million people who hunt deer in Minnesota. They're sitting outside in the woods or in the fields uh, for extended periods of time. You're typically very quiet when you're hunting deer. And so you can see all kinds of wildlife, not just deer, but lots of other animals while you're out there. And all of that information about what people are seeing and where they're seeing it, the types of habitat they're in, is really good information that we can use actually to understand more about our wildlife populations in Minnesota, more information than we could get on our own. So, you know, that's our pitch to people is, is come join us, help us out, and then we can do a better job managing these resources for future generations. Now, in the past, we've talked about the generational changes that are underway in Minnesota. And then the fact is there's newer Minnesotans who don't have this history of hunting and fishing that those who've been here for generations have. So what people want to do when they're out in the state parks in natural areas has changed over the years. How hunting and fishing is a, is a huge part of the fundraising that the DNR needs. What is the DNR doing to maybe bring new people into hunting and fishing? Mm -hmm. Well, we have all kinds of programs to make um, hunting accessible and, and welcoming to all Minnesotans. Um, one of those are, uh, is our mentored hunt program. So we can pair up new hunters with an experienced hunter who can go out and show you the ropes. We have a Becoming an Outdoors Woman program, which focuses specifically on recruiting more women to the sport. And I will say, um, as we celebrated the governor's pheasant opener this last weekend, the lieutenant governor was out, she hunted uh, with a group of women and, and made that point very strongly um, as we, we finished out the day of how important it is to get women involved in the sport. And so I think she did a good job being a role model. Um, and then we have um, skill building courses like our ICANN programs that are in, uh, those are run through our state parks. And um, it's not just hunting, but you could focus on archery, but also fishing and camping. And then um, we also, for people who may have a, a tradition of hunting and fishing, 
uh, in their background but may not have English as their first language, we've also now translated our hunting and fishing regulations into four languages in addition to English so that people can understand um, you know, more easily the rules of the road when they're out there. On the topic of funding, the DNR released a report called FOUR, the number four, the outdoors this year, and it's a kind of roadmap to sustainable funding for the Department of Natural Resources into the future. One bullet point that I found fascinating was that fishing is a $2.4 billion industry, but fisheries management, which ensures that there are actually fish to catch, is paid for mostly from the sale of fishing licenses. So in essence, a relatively few number of people are paying for a whole statewide industry. Is that something that needs to change? Well, that's really an argument that we're making in the report. And, and one of the things that we did to get to these recommendations was have conversations with Minnesotans. And I think many Minnesotans like you were fascinated in the idea that um, very few people are actually paying um, for uh, the, the maintenance of our fishing opportunities and our fishing industry. And the reality is actually, you know, once upon a time, we did make very strong investments as a state um, in our hatchery system, but that system is now 70 years old. We, of course, in our, our access to get your boat on a lake, we have um, more than 1,700 public water accesses that we manage. But again, those were built, you know, 50 or, or more years ago. And so we're getting to a place where without that additional state support, those foundational investments, we risk losing the opportunities that so many people have today. So that's really the case that we're making and Minnesotans are making with us. So this is a four-year plan and it begins in 2023 and some of the key phrases are optimize current funding, focus on fee use and application, and prepare for stable and predictable base funding. So ideally is the goal that there will be a level of dedicated state funding in conjunction with affordable user fees and kind of tweaking those, or is there more to it than that? Yeah, well, and the reason it's called For the Outdoors is there's really four strategies. Um, the three you mentioned, the optimizing uh, existing funding, um, the user fees, and then um, direct support. There were many Minnesotans who said, you know, I'd just like to give, and how do I do that? And then the, the stable funding, which is the one that's gonna take the longest, and so that's sort of the, the last strategy. Um, but yeah, the point is we know that we can't achieve the funding level that we need to continue to provide those outdoor experiences and the conservation services that Minnesotans want based solely on user fees. We would price people out of it. And so what that means is it's going to take some stable form of, of whether it's dedicated, um, you know, in a, in a capital D sense or in a lowercase d sense, um, but we heard lots of ideas from Minnesotans about how to accomplish that. And so we wanna dive into those conversations a little bit more, whether it is a dedicated portion or percentage of general fund, whether it is um, an excise tax route that some other states have taken or, or other mechanisms, you know, some of which we, we have here in Minnesota. Um, we wanna have more conversations with Minnesotans and then uh, with the legislature. Before we go, uh, we've talked about funding and the great outdoors and, and conservation funding crucial, but we also have issues with invasive species. And the Senate Environment Natural Resources Finance Committee met in August just for an informational hearing, but they heard from Peter Sorensen of the University of Minnesota who presented a plan that he said would stop invasive carp with a percentage of success 97 to 99% um, at lock and dam number five. He talked about the urgency of doing this before those invasive carp make it further up the Mississippi River. And so I just like your point of view on the invasive carp issue. Are we at a tipping point and do we have to do something sooner rather than later? I think we all agree this is a that invasive carp is an issue we want to get in front of and not wait until it's too late, similar to our approach on chronic wasting disease. Um, we have been focused on invasive carp since 2012, a lot of monitoring and surveying and understanding how the carp are moving so that we can craft the best uh, most effective solution. So um, where we are right now is working uh, with a variety of other agencies from USGS to US Fish and Wildlife Service to the state of Wisconsin and state of Iowa 
um, and then stakeholders within the state of Minnesota to work on a plan um, to, to look at further action. There is, there is no doubt we are seeing uh, detecting more instances of carp, particularly as we've seen high water. And so that is what is concerning, is that we're detecting more, we need to take some additional actions. And so that plan, which includes a look at the solution Dr. Sorensen proposes at Lock and Dam number five. Um, so once we finish that, we'll, we'll propose specific actions. All right, well, once again, it's been a pleasure having you um, on the program. Thank you so much. Thank you, it's a conversation I look forward to every fall.